Thank you. So we're here to rock the boat today. But I got to tell you, when you find yourself in dangerous waters, it can seem really foolhardy to rock the boat. If you find yourself, as uh, the great ship Britannia here did in 1793, between the rock of democracy and the whirlpool of arbitrary power, uh, any sort of movement might threaten to take you off course to your mission and your goal, your true path. Well, plus ça change, huh? I think mu museums like Britannia find ourselves in this position today. We're sort of caught between these two great powers that both put wind in our sails and threaten to pull us off course from our true mission to serve our communities. So on the one hand, we have the bedrock, if you will, of public funding, which is critical for keeping so many cultural institutions open, and yet is diminishing every year, buffered by the winds of political forces. And then on the other side, we have the vortex, if you will, of private funding for culture, which is also subject to commercial interests, not to mention the vagaries of the egos and the whims of individual private philanthropists. And even as the gap is growing between the rich and the poor in our societies, this, these straits feel increasingly narrow, crowded with more and more organizations competing for fewer and fewer resources. Unfortunately, these are familiar waters for museums. Charles Wilson Peale founded the very first art academy and museum in the United States in Philadelphia, and he devoted his entire career to lobbying Congress and the White House to provide funding for the arts and the culture and the museums and the research that they did. He argued that an informed and educated population was essential for the health and the sustainability of the democracy. Unfortunately, the founding fathers were no more generous towards museums and culture then than they are today. And perhaps it was understanding the futility, in some sense, of going after public funding for museums that led his son, Rembrandt Peel, whom we see here uh, in a self-portrait, when he decided to found his own museum to decide to take the other path towards private enterprise. So he came to Baltimore, he raised private investment, he built this magnificent building which opened its doors on August 14th of 1814, the very first purpose-built museum in the United States. Its innovation was it had a real modern art gallery on the back of the otherwise federal-style row house. And he depended on ticket admissions to sustain the operations of the museum. He needed to get people paying to come through the doors. And he was aided in this by another innovation he introduced at the museum, because Rembrandt Peel was not just an artist and an entrepreneur, he was also an inventor. And he started the Gaslight Company of Baltimore. He manufactured gas in the backyard of the museum, and he used the galleries as a showcase and a platform to demonstrate this new energy technology. We hear that people used to gather outside the building here, drawn like moths to a flame, aghast at the brilliance of the light streaming through the windows. They'd never seen anything that powerful. So when we hear reports of the huge increase in ticket sales in the evenings, we wonder were people going to see the exhibits, the art, the natural history objects, and the spectacles inside, or did they really just want to get close to this miracle of the new technology of gaslight? Rembrandt Peel's company has thrived since then. Within three years, he had secured the contract to supply gaslight to the entire city of Baltimore, its street lamps. And his company is now called Baltimore Gas and Electric. It celebrated 200 years this year. The museum, unfortunately, didn't have quite such auspicious fortunes. After 15 years of struggling to make the museum really a going concern, 
Rembrandt and his brother Rubens decided to sell the building, close up shop. The city bought the Peel Museum and used it as its first city hall. Later in the 19th century, it became the home to the very first public school in Baltimore for people of color. In the 20th century, threatened with demolition, the citizens of Baltimore came together and reopened the, the building as a museum of city life. Unfortunately, that too eventually failed, and in 1997, the Peel Museum closed its doors once again, and its collection was dispersed. The city of Baltimore has had similarly mixed fortunes, and today it's perhaps better known for images like this one taken by local photographer Devin Allen of the popular uprisings in 2015 against police brutality than it is for the full breadth of the creativity and the innovation among the communities in Baltimore. Baltimore needs to be known for the full diversity of those narratives. And this is not just a, a problem of branding and PR for the city. There's so much that the city has to give to the whole world. I think the world needs to hear these stories as well. And it's an urgent problem. As the African proverb goes, every time an elder dies, it's like a library burning to the ground. We need to collect and save and share these stories today. So the Peel is now being restored, renovated, and plans to reopen in 2020 as a center for Baltimore history and architecture. What can we do to help the city be known for new stories and new voices, for the full diversity of its talent and its creativity? We're gonna have to find blue ocean. We're going to have to find uncontested waters and new markets to sustain it, to take us beyond the Scylla and the Charybdis of public funding. And I think we also need to look back to the history of the museum to learn from its past, both as a, as a museum and as a platform for innovation for new technologies to find new ways of doing this. John Hendricks, the founder of Discovery Channel and Discovery Communications, wrote in his autobiography that so many businesses fail simply because they have failed to correctly define themselves. And he knew, because in his day, the TV networks failed to recognize the power and the potential of the new technology, the new platforms that cable TV were offering. As a result, entrepreneurs like Hendrix were able to come in, and he is now a billionaire. What are the new opportunities for museums in the cultural sector that the new technologies of the internet age are bringing to us? How can we learn from the past to create a new future? Well, if we start by thinking about what is the definition of our core business in the cultural sector, what is the currency, if you will, with which we trade uh, in the cultural markets, it would be easy to say uh, that it's the collections, it's the stuff that museums collect, be they objects and artifacts, or ideas, as you might find in a museum of conscience. And this is certainly true. But what I'd like to do today with this coin of Dolly Madison, I thought it was important to introduce a woman uh, from the period into, my early, into the earlier part of my talk, um, is to look at the other side of this coin as well. On the other side of the coin of our collections is all the content that grows up around those objects, that grows up around the stuff. So this is, yes, the labels and the metadata, but also the digital scans, the scholarship, the publications, and perhaps most importantly, the stories that are told about those collections and that are really the hooks and the doors that allow people to connect with them and find meaning and value. So as we start to think about the definition of the museum business in the 21st century, I think we need to do a new calculation based on a new definition of the collection as not just the stuff, but also the content and the stories. And I would argue the stories is where we are most impoverished, where we have the most work to do to really complete our collections. Now, as I mentioned, uh, the Peel had its collection dispersed at the end of the 20th century. 
So I like to think that today, its collection is the entire city of Baltimore, all of its stories, all of its places, and the people who know them best. That's a lot. That's a big collection. How are we going to create content to adequately represent that vast of a collection? I think, frankly, the only practical solution is to recruit the entire city to help us. And this is what we did in the summer of 2016 as a pilot project called Be Here Baltimore. We invited the storytellers of the city to tell us about their culture, their heritage, and what was meaning to them. The storytellers who joined us ranged from traditional griots to artists to students to professors to museum people to just amateur, passionate historians with a great story to tell. And today, we have over 500 stories that we've helped be published on a range of free and open platforms from mobile to web to social media uh, to help change the narratives that Baltimore is known for. And now, these stories have a home in the very first museum ever built in the United States, a platform to gain their proper place in the historic and the cultural discourse of the city and the state and the country. And even though the museum is undergoing renovation, we're able to partner with other storytelling organizations and initiatives like the Media Rhythm Institute, who will be running a summer school this summer at the Peel, helping 8 to 18-year-olds learn how to tell their stories of the city and its places through hip-hop songs and documentary video making. Now, really, we find the seeds of this, again, back in the history of not just the Peel, but of all museums. Museums have always been a place that creative people have come to make art, to learn, to exchange ideas, to take learnings away that they then use in their own creative and cultural practice. But now we have an opportunity with the new tools that have come about through in the internet age, through connected technologies, to help people update this practice for the 21st century. And that, I believe, brings about a redefinition of the museum mission, to take us beyond simply collecting, preserving, and transmitting the artifacts and the cultural heritage to future generations, but also to be platforms for the production of culture co-creating with the very audiences that we serve, ensuring that the full diversity of voices of our city are heard, and that our audiences are not just consumers of culture, but are also supported as active producers of it. So on that note, I would like to end by handing the microphone over to some of the great storytellers of Baltimore to tell you some of how they see the city and hopefully it will bring new light to you as well. During the Be Here Baltimore pilot, we funded local creators, museums, and neighborhood organizations to tell the story of Baltimore in their own words. Some decided to tell their stories with video. My name is Janice Curtis Green, storyteller and proud black Baltimorean. And let me tell you about my city, the Orchard Street Church is the oldest still standing structure in Baltimore constructed by and for African Americans. If you look at the intersection of Northway and York Road, you'll notice two things. First, a large stone wall that reaches north to Old Cold Spring Lane and south almost to 42nd Street. Second, you'll notice a one-way sign leading out of the community. Both of these designs were created for the specific reason to keep people out. Everyone's Place African Culture Center is one of 54 Black-owned bookstores remaining in the United States. They have been in business for 30 years. If you want to be in a place that smells so good, come here. At this house on 108 Montgomery Street was a funeral home founded by Roland Brown's father. The plans for an extension of I-95 through Sharp Lenden Hall and over Baltimore's Inner Harbor meant that all the homes on the street were slated for demolition. All the residents were forced to leave, and even after the plans for the interstate extension were scrapped in the mid-1970s, the homes remained derelict. 
In the late 1970s, however, as part of the Dollar Homes program under then Mayor William Donald Schaefer, the residences were auctioned off and miraculously, Roland Brown was able to purchase the home he had grown up in, an option not available to most of the displaced residents of Sharp Lenden Hall, who lacked the requisite credit to qualify for the housing program. In 1921, Hubie Blake and Noble Sissel joined forces with the vaudeville comedy duo Florine Miller and Aubrey Lyles to write a Broadway musical, Shuffle Along. When the all-black musical and cast premiered in May of 1921 at an obscure New York theater, it forever transformed the Great White Way's bright lights. We even had a local storytelling organization take their live stories and geolocate them on the app. It was raining and it was raw and my daughter was at a music lesson and I needed a place to keep out of the weather so I decided to drop into the Walters Art Museum here in Mount Vernon and what I saw there really changed my life. I was wandering around the galleries and I ended up in the ancient Roman portrait room. Now for those of you who are unfamiliar with ancient Roman portraits, they're a lot like decapitated heads. The Walters did something rather unusual. They set many of their best portraits squarely out in the middle of the room where you can see them from all angles, kind of like a cocktail party. So I got to see the back of the heads for once and I absolutely fell in love with the hairstyle on this dead chick named Julia Domna. And we'll leave you with this one last quote that encapsulates the whole idea of the Be Her Project. I feel like everything's art and everything can tell you a story so I kind of just suck it in from wherever. So handing the microphone over to our communities to share the culture that they know best and that they've been producing for generations is a transformative gesture that takes the museum from being a tre treasure house to a production house. And I think it charts us a new course through blue ocean, clear waters, to a new kind of sustainability for cultural practice in the 21st century. Thank you very much.